Thanks for joining us today or tonight. I guess it depends where in the world you are participating from. My name is Kristen Mays and I'm the Communications Manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network and your host for this webinar, which is made possible through the support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Today we're going to learn about Green Fins, which is a public-private partnership developed by UN Environment and the Reef World Foundation that leads to a measurable reduction in the negative environmental impacts associated with scuba diving and snorkeling. Before we begin, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour long. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the 30-minute presentation, followed by an opportunity for additional question and answer online through the Reef Resilience Network Forum, which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and practitioners from around the world. If you aren't familiar with the forum, you can use this platform to share resources and connect with other managers and experts. And at the webinar, end of this webinar, we'll provide some instructions on how you can participate in this discussion. There are two ways you can ask questions during the question and answer session. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we'll keep track of these for the end of the presentation. Or you can raise your hand during the question and answer session and I'll call on you um, to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking that little small hand icon on the toolbar just to the left of your name. And if you're having any technical difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please send us a message via the question box and we'll try to resolve the issue. Before I introduce our presenter, it'd be wonderful if you could tell us a little bit about yourself by answering the following questions. There, we'll see a poll in just a second here. So we, we'd love to know who you are by answering the following choices. Mm -hmm. We'll give you a, a few seconds to respond to this question and then we'll tally your responses. Okay, looks like the majority or other, perhaps we can understand a little bit, hear a little bit more about who's on the line during the question and answer session. And then um, also a, a lot of marine resource managers and practitioners. Wonderful. Okay, and then the next question. Love to know about the focus region of your work. Wow, okay. Vast majority from Southeast Asia Coral Triangle, um, then other, and then a split between Pacific Islands and the Caribbean. It's impressive for the folks if you're in the Caribbean. I know it's very, very late or early there for you. Um, okay, thanks for participating in the poll. That um, will really give Chloe an idea of who she's speaking to. And we are fortunate today to hear from Chloe Harvey, Program Manager for the Reef World Foundation. So thank you, Chloe, for presenting. Chloe has been instrumental in the implementation and development of green fins across Southeast Asia since 2008. She's led the development of the green fins assessment and training systems and delivered capacity development for the management teams in all of the active countries. As a passionate marine biologist who's been diving since the age of 12, with almost 10 years of experience of green fins in action. She offers a wealth of knowledge on the topics of marine tourism, environmental impacts, and managing sustainable practices. So thank you, Chloe, for, for being here today. I'll also introduce um, Chris Rotensulu, who's coordinator of the NOAA USAID C project. I believe he's also joining us today. There are a few little technical glitches. We'll see if he's online. But he, he's joining us to, to help translate between Bahasa, Indonesia, and English during the question and answer session. A um, little background on Chris in case he does get to join us. He has over 15 years field experience involving coastal resource management, marine conservation, and ecological research projects. Um, if he is able to join, we're very lucky to, to have Chris available as a highly knowledgeable translator. Wonderful. That looks great. 
on my end, Chloe. Yeah, thanks, Kristen, for that. And thanks to all of the Reef Resilience guys for this. It's such a great opportunity to be able to reach out. Um, a lot of you will be watching this live today, so thanks for joining me. And a lot of you will be catching up afterwards um, through the, the forum. So, um, yeah, so my name's Chloe Harvey, and I represent the Reef World Foundation, which is a UK charity. Um, and we work in partnership with the UN Environment on development and implementation of green fins and have done since 2004. So I'm going to be talking about building reef resilience with green fins. So let's get started. So outline of the, the presentation today, I'm going to um, go over the issue that we're going to be addressing. The solution through green fins, three elements of green fins, awareness raising, certification of dive and snorkel centers, and regulatory support. And then I'm going to briefly talk about the expected outputs that, that managers or dive centers can expect through implementation of green fins. So on to the issue. So tourism globally has been growing very quickly, and it's currently one of the largest and fastest growing sectors in the world. Um, the World Tourism Organization recorded over 1 billion international tourists in 2015, and it's predicted that this is going to double again by 2030. So this represents significant economic value, um, globally it contributes to 9% of the GDP and provides 1 in 11 jobs. Current regional figures are showing that the Asia and Pacific region is experiencing the fastest growth in international tourists too. So while this represents an economic benefit, if it's not well managed, it also represents environmental risk. So tourism can constitute a locally significant driver of marine life degradation. And it puts pressures on the ecosystem through lots of different ways, direct and indirect impacts associated with for example, developing infrastructures for tourists and other activities. So scuba diving and, marine and uh, snorkeling has been highlighted as a way that tourists can have direct impacts on coral reefs. And often significant diver damage is seen on frequently visited reefs. And a lot of you out there might have seen this firsthand as well. So this is why it's important that we work to promote a sustainable industry. While dive tourism is a risk and opportunity, it is also, sorry, while dive tourism is a risk, it's also an opportunity. So if we manage local direct impacts from marine tourism activities, it means that we're going to be able to build ecosystem resilience to those more wide-scale threats, such as overfishing or climate change. It means that we're going to be able to improve our marine life health and sustain ecosystem services for people and businesses. But as environmental managers, as a lot of you are, we can often feel that tourism management is not within our mandate, but environmental management obviously is. And so here I'm going to talk about green fins as a solution to these issues. So green fins is an approach for managing the environmental impacts of diving and snorkeling activities on coral reefs. So what is green fins? Greenfins basically is a code of environmental, uh, an environmental code of conduct. And it's also a robust assessment system to monitor and promote compliance to that code. It also provides strategic outreach to and capacity building among diving and snorkeling centers as well as governments. And support towards developing or strengthening relevant regulatory frameworks. So it's a program that's been developed by divers for divers. It influences core business, and it's proven and replicable. So Greenfins is currently active in a number of different countries, mainly in, in the Asia region. Um, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Maldives. We're soon going to be launching into Palau in the Pacific, and also hopefully into Sri Lanka. And we've got plans for expanding into the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, and the Red Sea. So hopefully we'll be touching on all of the major diving destinations fairly soon. So who actually is Greenfins? Greenfins is not an organization or an NGO. It's a management approach that can be adopted by anyone, anywhere. 
So typically GreenFind is implemented at the national level on a network approach which brings together both industry and government agencies, but it is an initiative of the UN environment and it's implemented in partnership with the Reforor Foundation. And then it can be picked up by governments who often work in partnership with NGOs and of course the diving industry. So in each of the countries where it's working, um, it's implemented, um, it's building meaningful public-private partnerships which are inciting environmental action. So Greenpeace is also helping governments to deliver on international environmental targets such as the Convention of Biological Diversity, IG Target 10 for example, as well as the Sustainable Development Goals, number 14 specifically. So this helps governments to help sustain the program in each of the countries that it's working in. So what does it, what does it look like from the dive centre's point of view? This, this is the membership process. A dive centre or snorkel centre can sign a membership form uh, free of charge and it's voluntary. They then receive learning and outreach tools and training delivered through assessors. And then assessments are carried out, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later on. And then they receive certification. This is done annually. And as long as they continue to show ongoing improvement in environmental practice, then they can maintain their membership. But if there's no improvement, then that's where the membership will be suspended. So it's driving that positive change within the dive centres. Certification is really a very proud moment for dive centres and they promote it heavily. Um, this is a quote from one of the managers in the Philippines. Greenfields is not some over-the-counter accreditation. They assess our dive shop and dive masters on actual dives and made suggestions on how we can improve. It really is becoming the go-to for the diving industry for promoting best practice. So I'm just going to lead you through a quick case study of what Greenfins might look like in a site. Um, I've decided to choose a site because it's a slightly easier example. And I'm going to talk very briefly about El Nido in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines national picture is um, a little bit more complicated and I'm not going to go into that right now, but I can obviously share that with anyone after the presentation. But in El Nido, um, they were experiencing or are experiencing booming tourism and this is um, there's a, been a recent expansion on the, in the local airport, which means that a lot more tourists are coming in. And most of this pressure is seen on the reefs through pressure from snorkeling, direct damage from the snorkeling activities. They really promote beautiful snorkeling trips out of El Nido. <laughs> I, can, I can recommend them. <laughs> um, but there was lack of effective management. This boom came without a plan beforehand. So. Um, a local NGO called the Arnido Foundation contacted us and asked if we could help them to implement green things in the area to try and address some of the issues that they were seeing. So we went over and worked with them to engage local government and um, we, we trained some of their staff as green things assessors in collaboration with some local government staff as green things assessors and then helped them to conduct training and performance assessments of the snorkel operators as well as dive centers but they were really focusing on the snorkel activities. So they've been doing that since 2012 now and um, they received some really positive customer feedback which meant that those dive and snorkel centres that weren't so keen to get involved from the beginning then became very keen to get involved. And what we're seeing is improved practice generally but also there were some stories coming from, um, from the water of snorkel boats actually um, encouraging other snorkel boats that are flying the Greenfin's flag to follow the best practice if they're seeing that they're not necessarily doing it. So we're seeing this industry self-policing as well. So I mean obviously the, 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 the problems aren't all gone in El Nido, it's an ongoing challenge, but we saw a lot of improvement after Greenfields was implemented there and it's an ongoing program. So moving on, I'm going to talk about the three elements of Greenfields. So this is first of all awareness raising the production and distribution of learning materials, delivery of training workshops for local dive industry. The second element is the certification of dive and snorkel centres. And then the third element is regulatory support. Now for us to be able to do um, the strengthening of laws and regulations, we need to have first implemented green fins to be able to identify what high risk activities we might want to focus on for that. So this is an offshoot of actual implementation. Certification of dive and snorkel centres requires um, capacity building input from Reef World Foundation and UN Environment. 
but the first step awareness raising is something that can be picked up and used by any resource manager, environment or project manager, government representative, dive centre manager, dive guide or tourist at any time. So I'm going to talk about this first. Production and distribution of the learning materials, first of all. Let me walk you through it. So as the UN Environmental Environment's lead technical partner on Green Fins, Reford have been documenting and collecting practical solutions to daily environmental challenges over the past 12 years during our work to help the diving industry implement the Code of Conduct. And the outcome has been the Greenfins Toolbox, which is really an, an analogical description of the combining of all of these lessons and tools. So the Toolbox can be accessed through the download section of the Greenfins website and comprises of three handbooks and the Greenfins Pack, which is the entire collection of guides, posters, presentations, forms, a load of really interesting stuff that's needed for Greenfin's implementation. And the three handbooks offer step-by-step -step practical guidance for implementing Greenfin's at first of all the dive center, at a diving destination or site level, and then at the national level for authorities. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the site level handbook, because I think it's the most relevant to the audience that we have today. So this handbook walks you through the steps of how you'd go about implementing green things in your area and it also outlines what resources and capacity is needed, what the enabling elements for implementation are and how it might actually look in your local area. It's, it's available as an, as an e-book, you can access it again through the Green Things website freely um, and then you can just click through, you can download it as well. Um, and it, it gives you loads of information. For example, here's a page that shows you what, who the Greenfins assessors might be, what, what skills they need, how many you might need for the site that you're looking at implementing it. So that's available to anyone today. And now the Greenfins pack. So this contains a series of documents, posters, like I said, that you can use to help promote best practice for diving and snorkeling. I'm going to briefly introduce the main ones, explain how they can be used. So here you can see the Greenfins Code of Conduct, which is a list of 15 actions and activities which dive, cent dive and snorkel centers agree to follow when they become Greenfins members. So by following these, their environmental impact will be reduced. We also have developed this into the guidelines to the Code of Conduct, which is a bit more of a friendly, more practical guidance to the Code of Conduct and how to follow it. And it categorizes the actions and responsibilities into the three main target audience groups, the dive operation, and the dive staff, and then also dive, diving customers or individual divers. So these can be printed as large posters or as individual categories displayed at dive sites um, and in dive centers or in main tourist thoroughfares such as airports, for example. And here we have the what we call the Greenfins icons or the, the best practice guidance. These were developed by Greenfins Thailand and they've quickly become very popular in the diving industry and were adopted by all the Greenfins countries and have since been translated into Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Russian, Vietnamese, lots of different languages. So these provide an excellent tool for dive guides, for example, during their environmental briefings and are also being used by local and national governments across Southeast Asia to, best, to promote best practice, for example, within MPAs or national parks, etc. So at the request and the help of dive staff, we selected the most relevant of these icons and put them into what we call the flashcards, the briefing flashcards. So there's three of these, and they can be printed onto waterproof paper, and they're small enough to be able to fit into a BTD pocket and can be taken underwater and used to guide customers if perhaps they're not following best practice. So again, these are available to download off the website. So the Greenfins philosophy is really one of sharing and educating and all of our learning material focuses on helping the diving industry to relay or explain certain messages to their guests that they might find difficult otherwise. One example is this no fish feeding poster which really explains step by step what the negative impacts of fish feeding or feeding marine life is to help businesses to say no. Another example is this clean and green recipe, which is um, designed to replace dangerous uh, chemical cleaning products such as Dettol that might be used in a dive center. And we have loads more, <laughs> and these are all available 
from the Greenfin's website. They're all soon to be available in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean as well. Um, if any of you want to produce any of these in bulk, or if you want to have a large signboard, for example, featuring any of these visuals, then let us know and we can help with graphic design to include your, web, your, your logo where appropriate. I'm going to include my contact details at the end. So as I said, they're all freely available, so go for it. <laughs> we also have a short video um, called Greenfins for a Blue Planet, an animation that was designed by um, the animator Jim Toomey as part of the Two Minutes on Ocean series supported through um, UN Environment. I can't show it now because of technical issues, but you can follow this link or you can just go to the Greenfins homepage where you can follow the link to it there as well. It's a really cool animation that just leads you through what Greenfins is and um, help you to explain it to other people, tourists, dive centers, etc. So another um, part of the awareness raising is actually running some workshops with dive staff, which helps them to be more engaged perhaps, but also helps for you to be able to reach out to them as resource managers or, or as um, project managers. So this is providing training in the use of the Greenfins tools and sharing of best practice. Um, we usually do, or, or Greenfins teams usually do about a 45 minute presentation where all dive staff are invited, boat crew, admin staff, as well as the dive staff and management. It can be done as a series of sessions at each dive center or as a group workshop, which also works quite nicely. And just as a note of advice, it should be held outside of diving hours to encourage participation. And it encourages sharing of information. It gives an opportunity to the diving industry to give you um, advice or, or hear, to hear their concerns about what's going on out on the water. So again, we have a presentation that can be used as an example, which again is available for download. So coming back to the three elements of green fins, I've just talked about the awareness raising, which is hopefully you feel that you've got the tools that you, you need to the, pick this up and get going with that. Um, Please don't hesitate to contact us at any time with any questions you have. So now I'm going to really briefly um, introduce the second and third elements of the Greenfins approach. The second being certification and the third being regulatory support. So certification. What does the certification system look like? Dive and snorkel centers are assessed against the code of conduct to monitor what practices are in place and measure how effectively they are removing risk to the marine environment. So assessors are qualified by ReefWorld following training on the use of an assessor manual, which looks a bit like this, which provides guidance to a comprehensive criteria. Each code of conduct item is graded either red for high risk, yellow for medium risk, or green for no risk of damage to the marine environment. An over overall environmental performance score is generated based on this. So the maximum score is 330 for high risk and zero for low risk. So the lower the score, the lower the environmental impact. So this allows Greenfin's teams to track how well dive and snorkel centers are performing as individual businesses, but also as a community, as a destination, or even on a national level. This way we can identify challenges and address them with solutions that are tailored to those specific issues. So we can actually use this data to start looking and seeing how, how Greenfin's is helping to reduce environmental impact. And what we're seeing across most of the, the sites that it's been implemented is this consistent reduction in environmental impact, which means that dive centers are improving environmental practices through implementation of Greenfin's. This is another site in the Philippines, Morbois, which is showing consistent improvement. So another quote. Um, Greenfins is the only thing that is changing the way the diving industry does things, and that's from Julian Hyde, um, who was a dive center owner, but he's also a manager at ReefCheck Malaysia, who's our, our lead technical partner for Greenfins there, alongside the Department of Marine Parks Malaysia. So alongside the um, environmental practice monitoring, we're also performing studies to observe diver behavior and monitoring rates of damaging con uh, diver contacts. And the results are showing us that divers diving with those operators who are compliant to the Greenfin's code of conduct make significantly less damaging contacts than those diving with dive operators who are non-compliant. So this means that Greenfin's is effectively reducing diver dam direct diver damage, which may lead to improved marine health. So coming back to the three elements, we talked about awareness raising certification system as well. 
And now I'm going to talk very briefly about regulatory support. So as I said before, um, to effectively inform strengthening of laws and regulations, we first need to implement a green fence. So once we have, the following steps may be taken. In collaboration with local or national partners, and with the support of the UN environment, REFOIL can conduct an analysis of current relevant laws and regulations. Analysis of Greenfin's environmental assessment data can highlight the specific actions and activities associated with the reef tourism industry that are currently posing the greatest environmental threat, as I showed you before. So this means that we can then make recommended revision or reform of legislative frameworks which are targeted to regulate activities that are really posing the greatest environmental threat. These recommendations can be presented to Greenfin's dive centres for, cons uh, for consultation but they've also already been part of the assessment process so they're already um, feeling like they understand the system and why these recommendations are being made which means that you have much more informed stakeholders. So in summary, the three elements of Greenfins, awareness raising, the production and distribution of learning materials, delivery of training workshops for local dive industry as well, which can be conducted by any dive centre or resource manager with immediate effect. The second element is the, is the certification of dive and snorkel centres, to be able to measure and promote compliance to best practice and requires further capacity building from reef world and new and environment. If anyone's interested in this, please don't hesitate to contact us. The third is regulatory support, which is a result of the initial implementation. So I recommend if, if any of you are really interested that you read the site in national level operational handbooks and then contact us with more information. In the handbooks it gives you information about what you should do to it and assess whether you think it's the right program or not for you. And then you can contact us with that information. Greenfield is constantly expanding to new sites and we're looking for new partnerships and collaborations to continue to make that possible. So awareness raising is the activity that can be started immediately by anyone. So what can we expect if we implement green fins in our local dive sites or on a national level? You can expect more engaged private sector stakeholders um, that are involved in more environmental activities. You can see increased participation in different citizen science programs. You'll get more data with no more input. You'll get stakeholders who are more informed on local laws and regulatory frameworks, reducing, uh, leading to reduction in conflicts. Generally, you'll see an improved awareness of the threats associated with the reef tourism industry and solutions to address these. And finally, you'll see improved environmental practice within reef tourism activities and reduced impact on, local, on the local marine environment. So in just a way of a summary and um, the key messages of this presentation, environmental impacts associated with the marine tourism are becoming an increasing concern. Greenfins provides a wide network of individuals who have been working to overcome these issues for over 10 years. Greenfins offers a proven approach to managing a sustainable tourism industry with measurable results and the tools to help you promote best practice in line with Greenfins are freely available for your use today. And I hope that's clear to you all now. <laughs> so, I encourage you to join the network and be part of the movement in whichever ca capacity is possible. We will continue to, to drive Greenfins to respond to the needs of both the industry and governments. We're going to continue to strive to deliver practical solutions which are industry-led. So please feel free to contact me and our team on info at greenfins.net and follow best practice in any way that you can. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chloe. That was informative and very interesting and beautiful slides, I might add, as well. Um, I, I now you. want to just open it up. Oh, very welcome. Um, I, I do want to open up the webinar for questions. Please um, remember there are two ways you can ask questions. You can raise your hand and I'll call on you so you can ask your question out loud yourself. And if you would like to ask your question in Bahasa Indonesia for Chris to translate, we ask that you do it out loud in that way. Oh, and I see we have someone already with their hand up. Dennis, I'm going to unmute you in just one minute. 
Um, the, just want to share the, the other option to submit a question is to, to write it and send it via the question box. Okay. Dennis, you should be unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. Dennis, are you there? Oh, we lost Dennis. We'll see if we hear back from him. In the meantime, I have a question here. This one is about the, the Greenfin's assessors and wanting to know who are the assessors and how does one get trained to be an assessor? Okay, so the the assessors um, are usually part of whichever institution um, adopts green fins at a site level or a national level. So that could be an authority, um, an environmental authority, or it could be an NGO that are looking at uh, reducing the impact of diving and snorkeling activities. So the assessors will be within those teams and um, there'll be divers if we're looking to train them as um, uh, diving assessors or, or keen snorkelers <laughs> if we're looking at training them as snorkel assessors. Um, so as a diver assessor we say that they should have at least 50 dives, obviously have a diving qualification as well, be able to speak good English and whatever the local language is um, if possible and have good communication skills. And they're put forward by whoever the institution is that has adopted Greenfins to the Reef World Foundation as potential candidates to become assessors. Um, and then the Reef World Foundation will come over and do an assessor training program, which is a six-day training program. We can, uh, we can train between six to ten people on any one training program. Um, we usually recommend for a site that has between 15 to 20 dive centers, um, between five to six assessors is really enough for that. So a six-day training program, which at the end um, will qualify as many people as has passed, and then to maintain their assessor uh, their assessor ship, <laughs> they need to do at least three assessments each year. Excellent. I hope that that answers your question. Please follow up with another one if that doesn't. Thanks, Chloe. Yeah. And. Another one, how many operating dive centers do I need in my proposed Greenfin site? So we would say a minimum of five really to make it worthwhile. Although there are areas where there are just, um, you know, if there are lots of small islands, for example in the Maldives, where in an area there might just be one dive center or one resort with a dive center. And if that dive center is really keen to get him on board, then there's no harm. But in terms of actually introducing green fins on a national or site level, we would say a minimum of five dive centers to make it worthwhile. And, as, and of course, there's no limit to how many you can engage. So between five and, and however many. <laughs> Great. So it really is specific to each site. Yeah. OK. Um, I have a question here from someone in the audience. Can you please comment on the difference between this and Project Aware PADI? Yeah, sure. So Project Aware um, promotes uh, that they do a lot of work with marine debris and um, shark awareness, uh, no shark finning, um, shark conservation generally. But they also, because they have been historically linked to PADI, which is a, a diver certification agency, um, they also work a lot with best practice for a diver. So it promotes specific best practice for you when you go diving as a diver. And the difference between that and Greenfins is that Greenfins looks at the industry. So it looks at best practice within a dive operation. So it doesn't just look at best practice for a diver. It looks at how you should be managing your waste, how you should be managing your um, harmful discharge to the marine environment, how you should be training your staff, etc. But then even more than that, and what really makes Greenfins unique against any other program in the world, is this robust assessment process that enables us to measure compliance to the code of conduct and also give us information on what sort of regulatory changes should be made to be able to support ongoing change on a, on a wide scale level. Great. Thank you, Chloe. Okay, another question here. 
Is there any model with the liveaboard dive industry that Green Fins has worked with? Yeah, so we've worked um, in the Similan Islands, so out of Kaolak in Thailand, um, where we have done assessments with the liveaboard companies there, and it is very adaptable. Green Fins has been very adaptable to the liveaboard industry and has been seen to have a big impact there as well. Excellent. Um, this is a question about the outreach materials. How were messages and materials developed for the three different audiences, dive operations, staff, and customers? So that's, um, so that's the guidelines to the code of conduct. So originally the Greenfins code of conduct um, was developed by the UN environment, actually over in the Caribbean, <laughs> um, and then further development uh, in Southeast Asia. And it was just a static list of 15 actions that, or activities that a dive center should do. But within that, we realized that there are a lot of responsibilities for the, the th three main different audiences, the dive center management, the dive staff, and the customers, well, all, all divers, really. And we realized that by breaking it down into those three different audiences, we could give people a lot more guidance on what they should really be doing every day um, to champion green fins. So by working with the dive industry and working out what sort of language we should be using and what's realistic and um, the sort of words that might incite that positive behavior, we then developed those three, three different lists or, or guidance for the three different audiences. It's actually relatively new, that. Um, so that's, that's really been a lot of research up, up until the delivery of that particular material. Great. Thanks, Kalei. Okay, question here. This is referring to the El Nido example, the Philippines example that you shared. You mentioned positive feedback that prompted other dive shops to want to join. What kind of positive feedback was it? Was it word of mouth, something else? Yeah, so that was actually with the snorkel centers. Um, so that was feedback from the customers saying that, uh, I think it was specifically in reference to fish feeding and how being taught the negative impacts of fish feeding actually added to the tourists' experience. Um, but I have, I have um, we, we have a team, or we're working with a team, the Alido Foundation there, who will be able to give a lot more information about the specifics of that. So if anyone has any more specific questions or if anyone's visiting El Nido, then please contact us and we can put you in contact with the people that are actually running green things there. Great. Yeah, and, and that can place, take place on the network forum, um, which we'll give a little information about um, soon. Okay. Can you please share an example of how a country has institutionalized green fins and aligned it with international commitments to secure funding for the program? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so so this, this is probably the, the most difficult part of, um, of if you were adopting green fins on a national level. Um, it's one thing to launch a program with small seed fundings, but it's quite another thing to sustain those activities over time. Um, and there's lots of options for that. And we have some good case studies from the different countries that we're working in. And no one model fits all is what I've learned. Um, obviously, a mixture of public sector funding mixed with private sector funding is the ideal, is um, a lot more sustainable moving forwards. But an example that I'd like to give is of Malaysia where the Department of Marine Parks Malaysia are using green fins to deliver on um, their, their commitments to Aichi Biodiversity Target 10. So through that, they've, they've written their action plans. They've identified the high-risk activities that they're wanting to address through that. And diving and snorkeling impacts was one of those, and green fins has been their approach to address those impacts. So by doing that, they're able to really embed green fins within their national um, frameworks. Also align funding, and it's part of their key performance indicators. So they, they can also align funding and resources, human resource, etc. So that's really helping to sustain green fins activities there. 
the way it works in, in Malaysia, because the capacity for assessors isn't really within, isn't really available within the Department of Marine Parks Malaysia, although it is becoming more available now, um, they've partnered with Reef Check Malaysia, who are really champion, championing the operational side of green fins in terms of conducting the assessment of dive and snorkel centres and doing the training and awareness raising. So they're receiving some funds from Department of Marine Parks Malaysia and also raising funds independently to support those activities. Wonderful. It's wonderful to hear. <laughs> um, okay, another question. This is maybe a little bit easier. How long does it take for a dive company or shop to become Greenfin certified? How long? Dive center, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once Greenfins is available in your area, um, you will either be given the opportunity to become a member by someone um, contacting you from, from the new Greenfins team, um, or you can go online and download the membership form and um, sign it and send it in to us, and then that means that we can register your interest in being a Greenfins member. But once you've signed up, um, the assessor will come by the dive centre and set a time to be able to do the assessment. And that will require them joining just a normal dive tour with customers as if they are a customer. So whether that's a one dive or two dive or even three dive day, um, they'll go out, do the dive, come back, they'll be asking some questions to you and the staff, and then they'll deliver some feedback to you where they'll outline three clear and realistic areas for improvement for you to focus on before the following year's assessment. Together you'll agree on those, whether you think they're realistic or not. And then the training typically then happens that evening after the assessment. So it's all done in one day, and then the certificate can be handed over at the end of that. So actually the process is only a day from the dive center's point of view once Greenfins is available in the area. Great. It's rather quick. Um, we in the Sea Project in Indonesia would like to explore a potential partnership with Greenfins in several of our project areas, how should we proceed to develop this joint project? Great. Um, so just contact us, uh, info at greenfins.net, or contact me directly. I mean, that does come through to me directly as well, but chloe at reef-world.org. And then um, we're actually in discussions with the um, with CTC, Coral Triangle Center, who I think, I don't know if there's anyone from CTC online at the moment, um, I believe but we, yes. we are talking with them about how to um, rejuvenate Greenfin's activities, specifically in Bali, but we would be looking at other sites as well if we can um, identify the resources to do that. So please contact us and we can put all of our heads together um, and also any government institutions that would like to be involved in that as well, we welcome um, all support. So let's let's put the, the pieces of the puzzle together and get Green Fins Indonesia going. <laughs> Excellent. Worthwhile already this webinar. <laughs> okay. If I want to start using the Green Fins Code of Conduct and the guides, do I have to get permission from Green Fins or can I just download the materials? You can just download the materials, absolutely, and we welcome anyone to do that. Um, I mean, one little request from us <laughs> would be that if you do use them, then to take a proud photograph and to send it over to us, because we just love to see where they're being used and how they're being used, but there's no permission needed. And like I said before, if anyone is thinking of producing any of these materials in bulk, or if they're wanting to print out a big signboard for an airport or an entry to an MPA, for example, and they'd like to have their logo put on it, again, just contact us. As long as you're producing the materials, we'd be happy to put a logo on it. We wouldn't typically do it for like a single dive center if they're doing it just for display in the dive center, because you can imagine if all of the, the Greenfins members, 500 plus around the world, wanted that, that would be a, a huge task from our side. But if you're a, a government institution or if you're a, an NGO or, or group, that would like to mass produce or, or um, do a large production of these materials, then please let us know. We'd be happy to include your logo in them. Excellent. Chloe, can you tell us a little bit about the, the study that you referenced earlier, this questions about 
how did you study the reef contact by divers with and without green fins? So I believe this question is interest getting at how that was measured, if you know anything about how that study was carried out. I do know a little bit about how that study was carried out. So basically, um, we, within our capacity at, at Reef World, um, we, we couldn't dive with green fins or non-green fins dive sensors, but of course, we're often diving with all of the, the green fins dive sensors, those who are following the code of conduct and those who aren't, because remember, to be a green fins member, you don't have to be a certain environmental standard level. Anyone can join as long as you're showing constant improvement. So within our members, we have compliant and non-compliant members, and we can see that by um, the assessment data. The assessment data shows us that. So while we were doing the assessments, we developed a protocol to be able to monitor damaging contacts underwater made by customers and dive staff. And we monitored that on each dive, uh, assessment dive, and then compiled or put together the, the data. And then we could then um, have a look and see uh, what the relationship between damaging contacts and compliance to green fins was. And that data is actually published, I didn't say this during the presentation, it's, it's published in an um, uh, open access journal, or it's an open access manuscripts or paper available and again I don't know whether that's been included as part of the resources for this webinar but I can send that over to be included on the forum so anyone can access that. Great, great yeah let, let's definitely go ahead and, and post that on the network forum as well. I think that that would be an excellent resource. Um, and we have a little bit of time maybe you can share one other example or a case study of a, a center implementing the Green Fins program? A dive center? Yeah, or, or actually any, um, anyone really it says dive center here, but it seems open. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm missing the question. Example of, of a dive center following the Green Fins code of conduct? I, I inserted dive center, it was a kind of a blank there. But another case study of someone on the ground using the materials will be my interpretation of that question. Okay. Um, sorry if I didn't get that right. Feel free to type that <laughs> back in. <laughs> um, an example of someone using green uh, I A couple spring to mind. Um, I'm always tempted to, to go for the straightly, slightly strange examples, which I don't know whether it makes it very useful or not. But we actually have been engaging a dive center in Panama, which is completely outside of the Green Fins active countries. Um, they picked up the Dive and Snorkel Center handbook and wanted to be a Green Fins dive center. Now, of course, they have to have the assessments to be an active Green Fins dive center. But anyone can be a Green Fins dive center by following the code of conduct. They just won't be certified unless they have the assessments. So I've been, I've been in contact with her recently, and we've actually followed her journey through a series of, um, of stories that have been published by the Underwater 360 team, um, and to, to follow, track her journey towards sustainability. And it just so happens that we have one of our teammates from Reef World is Costa Rican, and she's gone home, or is, is at home at the moment, and she's able to get across to Panama to do the assessment of that dive center now at the end of her journey to see how well she's done. So it would be really interesting for us to see this sort of remote support and how effective that is at a dive center level. So um, those, those articles, those stories are being released through Greenfield social media, so if you're interested in them, follow the Greenfield's Facebook page or Twitter and you'll be able to see this, the, the series and, and follow her stories. Her name's Jeanette, and she's with um, Scuba 6 Eco in Panama. But I think I can think of a better example of how all this is being picked up. Um, and another question just popped up too. Okay. All right, okay. I <laughs> can save you from the bell. Well, what, what, what maybe is, no, what maybe is interesting is, we, if we do have a few minutes, um, is to talk about the developments in Palau, which is in, um, in the Pacific. We're going to be going over there at the end of this month and doing a workshop, which is going to be the first steps towards initiating green things there. 
um, they are experiencing a huge boom in Chinese tourists in Palau. And um, they had, didn't have any management approaches in place to, to sort of prepare for that boom, but also to manage the tourists now. So we're going to be doing a workshop with the main government institutions who are involved in the diving industry, but also inviting the diving industry to that workshop as well to um, explore the issues and how Greenpeace can address them, but then work together to put, put an action plan for implementing Greenpeace and Palau together. And then off the back of that, we'll be coming back, hopefully, to be doing some assessor training and get the program going in Palau. So I think that's a nice example of how an activity or how Greenpeace might start in a country. Yeah, excellent. Very worthwhile endeavor, for sure. I think we have time for just one more question, um, and then I do want to wrap up to talk about some additional resources. Although divers do has, have significant impact on reefs through uncontrolled contact, improper anchoring of boats probably has more negative impact in some areas. Does Greenfins focus much on this issue? Yeah, so basically within the Greenfins Code of Conduct, the 15 actions and activities, um, it, out, it, it addresses all of the impacts that a dive center might have on the marine environment, but also focuses a lot on the positive impact that a dive center can have. So we promote sort of positive social um, impact as well as the negative environmental impacts as well. And um, one of the code of conduct points is no anchoring or use of mooring buoys, effective use of mooring buoys. And I talked about the assessment system and how we can actually um, get an environmental impact score associated with the, the uh, dive center. And to do that, we've broken each of the code of conduct points down and um, looked at the environmental risk associated with each of those and then weighted them according to environmental risk. And actually, anchoring is our highest impact activity. So we agree with you, whoever that question's come from. Um, we, we believe that anchoring is the, the highest impact activity that a dive center can, can have. So if a dive center is seen to drop a, an anchor on live coral reef, they will have a maximum score put against them for that. So yes. So definitely taking that seriously. Okay, and I'm sorry to the, to the audience to have to wrap up the question and answer session, but our, our time is, is almost up here. Um, if we haven't gotten a chance to, to answer your question, we, we can go ahead and, and post your question on the network forum for, for Chloe, and we encourage you to continue this conversation there. And we'll also post links to the relevant resources, so such as the PDF, well, we can um, share a PDF of the presentation, Chloe's presentation today, both in English and Bahasa Indonesia, we can also share, there's a, a case study on the Reef Resilience Network summarizing the Greenfins program. And so we can go ahead and, and share a link to that case study as well. And a couple of the other resources that, that Chloe has mentioned also listed here. So you can see the link, especially to that two minute video. It's very cute and informative, um, the one with Jim Toomey. And so there, there are links here. We will also send, let's see, this will be sent to you. A, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow, and there will be information with these links in it. But to, to go to the network, you go to reefresilience.org and click on the network tab to log in or join the network forum. And there are instructions here for how to do that. And as I said, whatever questions we, we didn't have a chance to get to will be posted here. And if you have any questions about logging on to the network forum um, or, or have any trouble with that, please feel free to email us at resilience, resilience, I'm sorry, at resilience, but resilience at tnc.org. And along the same lines, if you have any suggestions for future webinar topics, please um, send us uh, some suggestions to that email as well. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us tonight. And special thanks um, to our presenter, Chloe.
And before we wrap much. up, oh yeah, thank you, Chloe. Is wonderful. And so before we before we wrap up, just wanted to to make a quick announcement about our upcoming webinar, community-based climate adaptation tools. And this will take place February 21st, and you will have an opportunity to hear from Elizabeth McLeod, the climate adaptation scientist for the Nature Conservancy, and Darcy Chuck, environmental education and communication director for the Belize Audubon Society. And we'll learn about the new Reef Resilience Climate Adaptation Module, which will be released shortly, very exciting and lessons from participatory adaptation planning in Belize. So you'll get to hear firsthand uh, um, about both of those tools and, and lessons learned. So please, please let us know and maybe we could put back up that one slide with some of those resources just since we have one minute left. Yep, so they're here again and you can access all of, the, all of these resources. They will be posted on the network forum discussion site and you'll see a, a special post that's the follow-up discussion for this webinar and as I said we'll go ahead and post the the remaining questions there and you'll have an opportunity to continue this conversation directly with Chloe um, she can respond to, to your questions when so thanks again Chloe and thank you everyone for for joining us today and tonight <laughs>